Tonight, we continue in our devotional on witnessing at work. Uh, And as we talked in uh, recent weeks uh, about this devotional, we've also uh, talked about how this isn't just for those that are still in the workplace, but if we go to the marketplace or anywhere else, there is a a need for us to be witnesses, not only in our actions, but also in our words. And, you know, last time we talked a a bit about uh, how Jesus uh, spoke a lot about, uh, or how the Bible speaks a lot about Jesus being in the marketplace where he was interacting with people. uh, And, you know, we could correlate that to the workplace and how the Bible talks a lot about work. Well, tonight we are in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and we're going to be in verses 4 and 5 tonight, if that determines what page you need to be on uh, in your particular Bible. But uh, before we get there, uh, what we will be talking about is honoring God in our work. And if we honor God in the things that we do, whether we're in the marketplace, whether we're uh, speaking to friends or neighbors or in the workplace, uh, regardless of where we are, if we honor God, then we're going to bring glory to His name, which is a big thing that we need to be doing anyway. But what it will also do is it will open up doors for us to be able to witness, share the gospel, and share about our particular relationship with uh, God. And so tonight as we get started, though, I've got a a story to share with you. Uh, And this, uh, it says, George Sweeting, in his book, The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing, tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949, which would be almost 70 years ago, in 1949, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later, he was transferred and paroled to work on a farm near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, so 20 years after he's been in uh, prison, his sentence was terminated. Uh, And a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But John never saw the letter, nor was he told anything about it. Life on the farm was hard and without promise for the future, yet John kept doing what he was told even after the farmer for whom he worked had died. Ten years went by. So this is 30 years he's spent in prison, 30 years total that he's since he's been uh, convicted of this. Uh, And uh, so those 10 years went by. Then a state parole officer learned about Courier's plight, found him, and told him that his sentence had been terminated. Told him he was a free man. And the author of this book, uh, Sweeting, concluded that story by asking, Would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important message of your life, and year after year the urgent message was never delivered he who have heard we i'm sorry we who have heard the good news and experienced freedom uh, through christ are responsible to proclaim it to others still enslaved by sin and are we doing all we can to make sure that people get the message so are we doing everything we can in our situations whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's in the workplace, or whether it's anywhere in between. Are we doing everything we can to make sure that those that are sentenced to death uh, or sentenced to spiritual death, are we doing all we can to make sure that they hear the good news? Are we doing all we can to make sure that they hear the best, uh, most important message they could ever hear? And so that's, you know, that's what we're talking about when we talk about witnessing is really uh, we're talking about sharing through our actions and through our deeds because it's easy to, it's, I'll say it's easy, it's relatively easy to live a good life in front of people. You know, if, we, if we witness through our actions only, most everybody can do that. Uh, that's not too difficult. We can, you know, we can be kind, we can be gracious, we can show the love of God to people through our actions. But when we have to actually open up our mouths and share the gospel and, and talk with people, that's when it gets challenging for us because we're fearful of rejection. We're fearful of uh, what people may think or are they only going to think or are they going to think that the only thing I'm ever going to talk with them about is about Jesus and things like that. And so it is challenging, but nevertheless, that's what we're told to do. We're told to go into all the world 
and share the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them the things that have been taught to us about the faith. And so tonight, as we're talking about honoring God in our work, we're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And so we're going to be, as I said earlier, in verses 4 and 5 tonight. So follow along with me. And it says, and he, and, there, and, and the he that is being spoken of here is King Uzziah, okay? And it says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah uh, had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions and the uh, visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And so... What we know about King Uzziah is that you know he's in the uh, the the famous uh, or the he's in the uh, the lineage of the kings of Israel. His father Amaziah or Amaziah uh, uh, passed away, and when he did, Uzziah became king of Judah. Okay, he became the king of Judah at the age of sixteen, and so although he's not the youngest of the kings of Israel to come to the throne uh, at a very young age. Even though he's not the youngest, he's still one of the younger ones. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, you know, thinking about <laughs> the mental state of my two boys, I could not imagine them in three or four years being the king of a nation. I just, <laughs> I guess it would be a good thing that I wouldn't be here to see it. <laughs> Maybe that's just sort of the mentality I ought to have with it. But when we when we look at um, when we look at this, we we've got to think about this young man. He's come to the throne. He has a lot of responsibility. He's got a lot of temptations. He's got a lot of power. And even though he has all of these things, uh, it tells us there in that uh, in those verses. It tells us in verse five. It says he sought God in the days of Zechariah, uh, you know, who was a a prophet, and so. He, and it says there, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper, which implies what? Not just that God prospered him when he followed him, but what does that imply about the flip side of that? That there was time when he didn't follow God and God did not prosper him or the nation of Israel uh, during those times. But while he sought out the Lord, we know uh, in all of his work, we know that God prospered him. But we know that he, came, he became prideful from what we read in the scriptures. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 16 through 20, uh, we read about how uh, he became uh, very prideful. And when he did, uh, when he thought it was all about him, when he thought it was all, you know, the, the success of the nation of Israel was because of him and that he didn't need, uh, didn't need anything from anyone or from God, God withdrew his hand of blessing. And so we all from the scriptures understand what that means for not only him, but for the kingdom of Judah, that they uh, were uh, facing a difficult time. But we also know that uh, one of the things that is told us in the scriptures is that not only was Uzziah, uh, his, the blessing of God removed from him, he was also afflicted with leprosy uh, because of that pride and God trying to get his attention. And so... Uh, we know that from the scriptures, that's what uh, went on with him. Now, when we look at what we do in our daily life, whether it is something that we do for someone else, whether it is something that we do at work, whether it is uh, something we might do in the church uh, to serve or whatever the case may be, uh, we understand that we need to be like Uz uh, King Uzziah was when he's mentioned in verse 5 about how as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. We need to seek the Lord and we need to honor the Lord and give glory to God when he uh, helps us in our day-to-day -day life in the ways that we are able to care for others or do for others or just in our opportunities to witness to other people through our lives and through our words. When we do that, what we see is that God is going to prosper us. He's going to, and when I say prosperous, that's not like what you see from those phony balonies on TV that, you know, that tell you, you know, send in $100 and God's going to fill up your bank account. That's not the kind of prospering we're talking about. What we see is though that God is going to prosper our, uh, our work for him. 
And that's what we ought to be concerned about. We shouldn't be concerned about whether God's going to fill our bank account or whether He's going to bless us in this way or that way. What we need to do is make sure that what we're doing in sharing the gospel and serving Him by talking to people and serving others, when we do that, when we give Him the honor and the glory, God's going to bless the work that we're doing. He's going to help us to accomplish great things for His kingdom when we do that. And so we need to make sure that we uh, serve God in our daily life and in our daily work, whether it's in the marketplace or in the uh, workplace or whether it's uh, serving our neighbors or, or whatever the case may be. But when we do, we need to serve God in all that we do and ask Him to keep our eyes on Him, you know, to help us keep our eyes on Him and so that we stay focused on Him. Because if we stay focused on Him, it's like Peter stepping out of the boat in the storm. As long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he didn't have any trouble. But when we let our eyes wander from God and He's no longer at the forefront of our uh, of our mind, then what we see is we start to stumble. We start to go down in the storm. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, God talks about in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when He... Uh, when he's giving the law to the Israelites through Moses, he talks about how you're supposed to talk about the law with your children uh, as you walk by the wayside and by uh, you know when you're at home and to post them on your doorpost and all of these things he's talking about doing. And you're to have them as frontlets before your eyes. You know, the Jews at one point, they were so caught up in their religion and not their relationship with God that they actually had these these things that would hang before their eyes with the uh, with the law, you know, or at least uh, small portions of the law, and that was so that they could keep their focus on the law. Which I don't know how they walk around or do anything with those sort of things in front of them. But that's the idea of what we are to do with God: that we are to keep Him in our in the forefront of our mind, in front of our uh, in 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 focus, in view of us all the time. And when we do that. What we'll see is that it, it becomes easier for us to serve Him. It's easier for us to talk about Him. It's easier for us uh, to witness to others. And it sort of goes back to what Paul talks about when he was writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3. So I'm going to have you turn over there, uh, Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to see how Paul tells us that uh, how we ought to uh, sort of do what King Uzziah was doing. And so we're in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And the interesting thing uh, is that uh, just a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this particular verse or one part, part of this verse was uh, the theme verse for the a week at Caswell. And so I thought, as I read through the devotional, I was thinking, well, that's kind of ironic that not too long ago this was the theme verse at Caswell. And here tonight we're going to be praying for our youth and our leaders going to Caswell. But in Colossians chapter 3, in verses 23 and 24, Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And so Paul is reminding us that everything we do, what, whatever we do, we ought to do it as if we're doing it for God and not for man. Now, let me ask you, if we were to do everything, everything, like the way we serve our spouse or treat our spouse or do things for our spouse or our neighbor or our children or our grandchildren or the person at the grocery store or the people that we work with, if we were to serve them, okay, and I'm not talking about, you know, groveling on your knees with a, a platter over your head top, but just in our day-to-day -day life, in the way we interact with them, if we were to serve them, As to the Lord and not to men, how would your attitude, how would your actions be different towards them if you did it as to the Lord and not to a man or a woman? Would it be just a little different? Pastor, Pastor Nick saying to himself, yes. I, mean, I see the grins and I see the nods of the heads and we would all be that way. I think that, you know, if... You know, if, 
if it were Jesus standing there in front of us, our attitude is going to be a lot different. Our actions, our speech, our interaction is going to be much different than it is with other people. You know, regular men and women that we come into contact with. Now let me ask you, should it be that way? No. We ought to treat them the same way that we would treat God, that we should interact with them. That as he says there, everything we do, the way we serve people, the way we minister to people, the way we just, you know, interact with people ought to be as if we're doing it to the Lord and not to a man or a woman. And when we think about that, you know, yeah, I, I think about uh here recently, uh what was it? I can't remember um uh, what was it? One of the boys woke up in a bad mood got up on the wrong side of the bed. I can't remember what it was. And like right out of the gate was snippy with me and Misty. I mean, it was just like, I mean, it's like 6.30 in the morning and he's just, he's already in a bad mood and I'm thinking, great. I think it was Drew. Cooper don't know what, Cooper's not generally in a bad mood. If any, either one of them is, it's Drew. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was just snippy and ill and I mean, just from the get-go. And, you know, it colored the rest of his day. And my mom never had to fuss at him when he was at grandma's for the day or anything like that. But, you know, it just, when I went and picked him up that afternoon, he was still in a bad mood. It was just one of those things. And if we are, you know, if we are treating people like that, if we treat people, uh, you know, disrespectfully or uh, are short with them or, you know, ugly towards them or whatever you want, however you want to phrase it, if we are that way with them, as a, a general rule of thumb, if that's just our general demeanor towards people, then you know we have to see that the way we're treating them is definitely not the way that God would want us to first off treat them, but much less how we would treat Him, how we would serve Him, how we would do things for Him. Because that morning that uh, Drew was in a bad mood, I think is the best way to put it, uh, he was not happy about the fact he had to load the dishes or fold clothes that evening or whatever the case was. He was just, he was in a bad mood and it was just all, you know, just rough and tumble and just mad and just mad at the world type thing. And because of that, you know, he wasn't doing things that me and Misty asked him to do as to the Lord. He was doing it as to men. And so we have to see that we have the opportunity to interact with people. And when we treat them like we would Jesus, if he were the one standing in front of us, it gives us the opportunity to uh, make inroads into spiritual conversations with them. Because think about it, how many people are, how many people do you know that you could come into contact with anywhere? Neighbor, grocery store, workplace, wherever it is. How many people do you know of if you uh, were a sourpuss, as we call it, you know, towards them, if that was your interaction with them, how many of them do you think would want to hear about your Jesus? I'll tell you right now, somebody comes up to me and is aggravated and irate with me or or just not treating me, you know, like I would generally expect. Last thing I'm gonna do is sit there and listen to them about their loving God that wants to, you know, change my life because what I'm gonna think is if they're wanting to change my life like theirs is, I don't know that I'd want that. You know, and that's we have to be careful about that. We have to be mindful of the way we interact with people because wherever we're at, we have to make sure as Paul says, and even as we see in Uzziah's life, that when we put God at the forefront, when we make sure that we are treating people like we would treat him. God's going to prosper that work. He's going to make sure that we uh, that we make inroads for the gospel and for the kingdom uh, like he would like he wants. See, Jesus once told a parable of a nobleman who uh, entrusted some of his wealth to some of his servants. And I'm not going to ask you to turn here, but I'm going to read this to you. It's from Matthew chapter 25. And it's verse 21. And what we see is that to the one who made a wise investment, Jesus, or not Jesus, the master uh, doubled the profit. Uh, he gave his master double the profit. And this is what he said. He said uh, to the servant, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so right here, what we see is that God wants to entrust us with small things and he watches us. He tests us, so to speak. See how we're going to do with a little bit of responsibility. And 
then if we are found faithful and don't squander the opportunities that he gives us, then he's going to multiply that. He's going to make it a little more and a little more. It's kind of interesting. On our way to church this evening, we got behind a moped uh, on the Cages Mountain Road. And as we were coming up through there, we were like three cars back, and it's in the curvy section, and they're riding in the middle of the lane. So Drew, Drew just sort of leaned over and said, we're going to be late for church. This is like 15 till 6. You know, he's like, we're going to be late for church. I'm like, well, probably not, but okay. I was going to, whichever way they went at the end of the road, I was going to go the other because uh, I'd still make it quickly either way. But anyway, so as we're riding down the road, Drew asked me, he said, do you have to have a driver's license to drive a moped? And I said, no. I said, you don't have to have a driver's license to drive a moped. And he said, I know what I'm asking for Christmas. And I told him, I said, I said, yeah, but you still have to have a, a parent who will let you drive it on the road. And he said, oh, never mind. He said, I'm going to ask for a tractor. I said, I can hook you up with that. Uh, but it's that mentality, you know, you know, I said, I told him, I said, you have to have a, a parent who will let your 12 year old or your 13 year old drive it on the road. You know, and at 13 years old, yeah, a moped, although not on the road, would not be a bad start for it. But, you know, you have to work up to those things. And as you are given, we all understand that when you're given a little bit of responsibility with something small, something larger comes along. And if you're found faithful, more responsibility is given. That's what God promises us, is that when we are faithful to honor Him in our work, in our interactions with other people, in the way that we treat people, and when God sees that we're faithful to do well with what He entrusts to us, our finances, the gospel, our speech, our time, our talents, our abilities, our spiritual gifts, all of those things, any of those things that He has entrusted to us, when we are faithful to use them. Even in small ways, God will multiply what He does, what He's able to accomplish in our life. He'll He'll give us more responsibility. He'll give us more opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, you know, and God will reward us for our faithfulness to Him in our work, whether it's whether it's a, a nine to five job or eight to five job, or whether it is uh, some other uh, means. And He will be glorified uh, through it when others see Him in us. When, when they see us reflecting the uh, godly or Christ-like characteristics and traits to them, they're going to see God in us. They're going to see Him through all that we are and everything, and they're going to see the love of that Jesus that we talked about, the love of that God uh, we talked about a few minutes ago, that uh, they'll see that, and God's going to be glorified through that. We're going to honor Him through what we say. We're going to honor Him through the way we treat people and the way we interact with them. And, and through all of that, yes, that is a good opportunity for us to witness through our actions, but also through our speech. And so that is the end of tonight's devotional.